the Covenant, a religious authority of various races throughout the Milky Way galaxy that seek nothing more than to ascend and begin their great journey. Within the Covenant, there exists a hierarchy consisting of the San Shayum at the top, the Sanghili under them, then the Jirohane, Hirogok, Legolo, Yanme, Kigyar, and finally the Ungoi. Among all of these exists the collective history of the Covenant, each race's individual history, and even their mythology. I'd like to point out that some of these races have a more flushed out history and mythology than some of the others due to their importance throughout the series. But as you'll see later on, each shares distinct connections to the religious and mythical influences that make up this hegemony. Going over my research into this, I realize that there is a lot to what makes up the Covenant, not only in their individual histories and mythologies, but their ranks, weaponry, tactics, and vehicles, all of which I plan on exploring in further videos. To better understand the myths and legends of the Covenant, I want to first explain not only the series itself, but the Covenant's singular and shared desire. So without further ado, let's begin. Stay with the Master G. He'll know what to do. Yes, sir, Sergeant. Thanks for the tank. He never gets me anything. Oh, I know what the ladies like. Following the numerical order of the games Halos 1, 2, and 3, you play as an augmented human, who is known primarily as the Master Chief. Flying through deep space, you discover ancient ring worlds that were made by an extinct race of beings known as the Forerunners. Along your journey, you encounter the Covenant, the conglomerate of races wanting to activate the rings, not fully realizing what is hiding within the depths of the ring an even more ancient collective that infects and devours whole worlds. Upon destroying the ring, known as Installation 04, you return to Earth, but run into more trouble, as the Covenant unwittingly discovers humanity's homeworld. By this time, the Covenant itself is beginning to fracture, and a great schism is taking place within the holy city known as High Charity. Taking on the role of a dishonored elite, called the Arbiter. Alongside the Master Chief, you discover that the leaders of the Covenant are willing to sacrifice everything and everyone to activate the rings. Returning to Earth, you learn that the ancient Forerunners had built a portal on the planet to a distant machine world designated Installation 00, known colloquially as the Ark. Existing outside the Milky Way, it's here that all seven rings can be activated simultaneously. Unfortunately, what followed both humanity and the Covenant to the Ark was the devouring collective, known as the Flood. Desiring the array to not be activated to prevent its death, the Flood briefly aids in dismantling the Covenant. As the Ark is a foundry for the rings, both the Master Chief and the Arbiter fire a newly formed installation within the Ark's atmosphere, subsequently destroying not only the Ring and the Ark, but the Flood as well, leaving the galaxy in a moment of peace for the races of the Covenant and humanity to rebuild. The Prophet of Regret is planning to activate Halo. Are you sure? I shall light this holy ring. Release its cleansing flame and burn a path into the divine beyond. Pretty much. Spoken about constantly throughout the main games as well as some of the spin offs is the Covenant's desire to begin something known as the Great Journey. This is the central religion within the Covenant Empire that drives their every move to achieve transcendence. Its core belief stems from the main artifacts that have been found throughout the many planets and systems within the Milky Way, showing up primarily on the planets that have substantial and intelligent life on them. These artifacts that were found were made by beings known as the Forerunners, a highly advanced race that many within the Covenant believed to be gods. Upon finding the Sacred Rings, the Covenant, or more specifically the San Shayum, believed that activating these sacred rings allowed their perceived gods, the Forerunners, to ascend into complete godhood. 
apart from their corporeal selves and existing as one with the cosmos. As I mentioned before, it was the Centrium who were the originators of the Covenant and the belief of the Great Journey, seeing all who weren't believers of the higher power of the Forerunners as inferior. In the efforts to expand the religious fervor of Ascension, the Sanshayum would run into the different races that would make up the future of the Covenant. Starting with the Sanghili, Hirogok, then the Lekolo, the Yanmei, Kigyar, Angoi, and finally the Jirohane. Here we'll be exploring the first of the two races, the Sanshayum and the Sanghili. Its divine wind will rush through the stars, propelling all who are worthy along the path to salvation. As a race of humanoid worm-like beings, the Sanshayum have a complex history with the Forerunners and their technology. I won't go into full detail on that here, but it is something that I plan on covering in a different video. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out. Looking at the race of the Prophets, they're known as well by their Latin name, Perfidia Vermis, meaning treacherous worms. This is fitting, as it's the prophets who commit the most treachery amongst the Covenant. Bickering between the races, and allowing others to maim or dismantle any opposition, as seen with the Jirohane's takeover and the Ungoy rebellion. But more on that later. In myth, worms are seen as some of the most evil of the monsters, Primarily recognized as dragons or serpents during antiquity, there are a few that are quite notable. In Norse mythology, Nidhogg is a worm, spelled with a Y, and a serpent-like dragon, one that lives among the roots of the Tree of Life, Yggdrasil, roaming atop the realm of the dead known as Niflheim. Nidhogg is known to bite the roots of the tree and devour the dead. Worms are especially recognized within Old English, as seen with the Epic of Beowulf. Being the third and final monster fought within the Epic, Beowulf faces a fierce dragon alone, where the story states, The poison breath of that foul worm first came forth from the cave. Hot, reek of fight, the rocks resounded. This provides a view on how dangerous these worms were believed to be, as the dragons could not only breathe fire, but could emit a noxious gas to poison their foes. This is what's seen within the Covenant as the prophets lie and poison the minds of the other races, making them upend thousands of years of history and mythology to assimilate to the Sanchayum's beliefs and desires. Living as the Hierarchs and highest members within the Covenant, they oftentimes take up a role known as the Prophet, who are said to commune specifically with the ancient gods that they worship, formulating the theology that the Covenant follows with such enthusiasm. In many religions around the world, the role of Prophet has been seen as a divinely inspired person who is able to communicate with the deities of their faith serving as the middleman between a singular god, or many gods, and the people who worship them. This role has been seen in not only Abrahamic religions, such as Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, but as well in the ancient Greeks, as conveyors of prophecy and unseen knowledge given divinely. The prophets used their status and capabilities to establish rule and law within their following, some of the most notable prophets in history include Muhammad, Moses, Abraham, and Jesus Christ, all of whom were committed to the covenant established by God to establish rule and law, as well as providing a guide to one's salvation. However, I should mention that within Christianity especially, a concept called the false prophet is highly significant, as this is something that can twist deceive, or even falsify the given word of the divine. As seen in Matthew 24, 24, it states, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, 
if possible, even the elect. I mention this, as with the prophets of truth, regret, and mercy, they are all false prophets, leading their following not to a heavenly transcendence, but to their complete end. It's worth noting as well that each of the prophets of the covenant are exact opposites of the virtue that they themselves represent. The prophet of mercy is quick to judge and act without mercy. The prophet of regret acts and speaks without a filter, showing no regret for his words. And nearly all of truth's lines spoken are lies or half-truths, ringing true to the term false prophet. In their lives, both before the covenant and during it, the prophet's race of the San Shayum lived a life of pleasure. Otherwise known as hedonism, they sought self-indulgence over other pursuits, as many of the hierarchs viewed themselves with higher intent than many of the other races. To the Greeks, living as a hedonist was seen as being a worshipper of the goddess and personification of pleasure and enjoyment, Hedoni. Born from Eros, the personification of love, and Psyche, the personification of the soul, Hedoni focused more on the sensual and personal side of pleasure, and is the root to the term hedonism, or the act of being hedonistic. Many of the Stoics during the time that Hedoni was worshipped were entirely against the goddess's worship. Viewing both the personification and the thought behind hedonism, or self-indulgence, as being against the natural order and without proper reason. This falls in line with how the San Shayum originally viewed the Forerunner technology upon their discovery. The Stoics among the race, seeing the tampering with the advanced technology as against natural law and reason. However, the reformers that opposed them desired to learn and advance from its discovery. This technology that was found by the Shan Shayum is actually the forerunner ship that we see within High Charity during the final missions of Halo 2. This armor suits you, but it cannot hide that mark. Nothing ever will. You are the Arbiter, the will of the Prophets. But these are my elites. Their lives matter to me, yours does not. That makes two of us. Hmm. Known as the Elites to Humans, the Sanghili are a bipedal Saurian race of warriors that have been seen as the primary enemies throughout the Halo series. This race is extremely prideful and honor-bound in any actions they take part in. Up until the Great Schism in 2552, the Sanghili were primarily the military force within the Covenant for thousands of years. Originating from the planet Sanghelios within the Ur's system, the Sanghili live within what we would refer to as city-states, or polis, similar to how the ancient Greeks lived. Unsurprisingly, the Sanghili are believed to be a polytheistic society, meaning that they worship more than one god. One god within their pantheon in particular, and more than likely their central god, was Urs, the same name as the star Sanghelios revolved around. Being a sun god, Urs is seen as the most ancient within the Sanghili's pantheon. This divinity is nearly identical to many other sun gods seen throughout the many religions and cults of worship around the earth. In Egyptian mythology, the sun god Ra was seen as the single most important god. Being the ruler of the sky, the earth, and even the underworld for a time, Ra was seen as a creator of all things within Egyptian religion. Growing crops for farmers and providing warmth for all life on and in the earth. Worship throughout Egypt's history until the Arab conquest in 639 CE, many celebrated their sun god with the care of his embodiment, the Menvis Bull, sitting in the center of Heliopolis, one of the major cities of ancient Egypt. Giving the name for both Sanghelios and Egypt's Heliopolis is the Greek personification of the sun, Helios, 
Being a Titan god of ancient Greece, Helios was born from the Titans Hyperion and Thea, the Titans of the bright sky and sight, respectively. Helios was worshipped not only for the warmth and light that he brought with the sun, but as well for being the god of oaths, as many during the late antiquity in both Greece and Rome would swear oaths under the shining sun. Helios' worship was turbulent throughout ancient Greece, as his prominence was substantial in the pre-classical era between 800 to 500 BCE, then diminishing during Greece's Golden Age sometime after that, and growing again some 400 years later. His prominence was so profound during the pre-classical era that the city of Rhodes crafted a colossus in his honor, creating one of the ancient wonders of the world. In addition to the worship of the sun god of ancient Greece is the actual name of the star that sang Helios revolves, Urs, as the term Urs is used mainly in both the Middle East and India as the celebration of the anniversary of the death of a Sufi saint. In Islamic worship, Sufism is a sect of mysticism that focuses on the purification of both the person's mind and body. With Urs, a saint who followed Sufism within Islam would spread the message of God and spread Islam's influence to new people and new regions. These saints would then be venerated and celebrated both in life and death, providing a sense of honor to any who followed them or expanded their work. This is not far off from what is learned about with the Sanghili, as their view on death is wholly sentimental and extremely honorable, with many of their fights against humanity being held in close quarters as their weapon of choice was the energy sword, allowing combatants to battle face to face, desiring above all else to draw first blood. According to Sanghili tradition and belief, blood was integral to their way of life, being not only the substance that kept them alive, but was viewed in a ritualistic manner, as blood could only be spilled on the battlefield. In any other case of Sanghili blood leaving the body, it was seen as intolerable and without honor. Like many other religions around the world, the spilling of one's own blood, or in other words, suicide, was extremely frowned upon and went against the core values of their society. This is something that I'll be explaining at a different point in time. Unsurprisingly, the view on blood is not far off from what we know within humanity's early history. Much like how the Sanghili were a warrior culture, the Greeks, namely the Spartans, had this same view and belief on blood. Viewing it as holy by many, they believed that if weapons were drawn in any setting, combat must be had as weapons demanded blood. However, where they differed is in the view of medicine and even philosophy, as many who studied blood or thought about it believed in both red and black blood. The red blood was obviously the blood that flowed through the body and gave a body its breath, according to Hippocrates. However, the black blood, as Plato thought, was a bile of sorts, a formation of disease that can infect the mind of any person should it reach the top of someone's head, known as the crown. Again, this view on blood is not uncommon in other religions as well. Within Aztec mythology and cosmology, the sun god Huitzilopochtli battled against the darkness of the sky for eons. To combat this and aid their sun god, priests would claim human sacrifices in the name of their god, cutting out the hearts and collecting the blood in order to feed Huitzilopochtli, maintaining the status quo that the bright light of day brought. In Christianity, for instance, blood is seen as a holy relic, and once again stands firm on the belief that spilling one's own blood could condemn the person to eternal damnation. In contrast, to drink the blood of the Savior is to be saved and earn a place within the kingdom of heaven. This 
concept actually created the communion that is still practiced today as ingesting the bread or the body of Christ and drinking of the sacramental wine or the blood of Christ solidifies the covenant of man and God. This brings up our next point, the beginning of the covenant, as it was the Sanghili who were the first race to join the covenant of races. After years of fighting against the San Shayum and losing thousands of lives, if not millions, the San Shayum and Sanghili chartered a peace agreement, establishing a codependency and creating the religious society that would become the covenant, sharing and assimilating the San Shayum's beliefs and religious practices. What I find interesting is the use of the term covenant in relation to this union, as what could have easily been used instead could have been confederation, alliance, or even a coalition. But covenant is the title that they landed on. The reasoning for this is that many of the other terms have a more political or military union of two factions or tribes, while the term covenant establishes a religious union between the two, allowing the military and political side to take a more supporting role. The most common depiction of a covenant in religion is within the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Seen within the books Genesis, Exodus, 2 Samuel, and Matthew, we see depictions of covenants being made between man and God. Specifically, in Genesis 9, 8-17, God proclaims to Noah his faithful task of creating the ark. As well, within Exodus 19, 5-6, Moses is asked to keep his faith and guide his people to salvation to find the Holy Lands. As well, within the pre-Islamic days, as the prophet Muhammad was growing in his belief, the Arab factions of Awaz and Khazraj fought for years before finally settling their differences in the name of Islam, becoming the Ansar or Helpers together creating a religious covenant between the two in honor of their faith. This is not far off from the fighting and the unification of the San Shayum and the Sanghili in the name of religious worship and advancement, which was only possible due to the efforts of the most sacred of the Sanghili warriors, the Arbiter. As the fiercest and highest ranking among the Sanghili warriors, the Arbiter held immense power and authority over much of the military and even the politics on the planet. Meaning, the one who judges, the role of the Arbiter would be the one who would seal the future of their race, being the one who joined his forces with the San Shayum, codifying the future of the Covenant. In researching this, I found that the original name of the Arbiter was going to be Dervish. However, as it was too close to the religious context, Bungie decided to change it to the Arbiter. In Islam, the term Dervish refers to a member within Sufism who devoted their life to poverty to focus on the universal values of love and service to God. What's interesting is that many viewed the Dervish as miracle workers or supernatural persons able to sway both political and military movements in their favor, or, in other words, in God's favor. Within the Abrahamic religions, an arbiter was said to be a piercing angel who would test a person's resolve in their faith, scrutinizing their loyalty to determine if they were worthy to enter heaven. In addition, the arbiters were called accusers by some, including the Hebrews, as they would accuse people of their sins judging them to see if they would crumble or strengthen their resolve and their faith. The most notable arbiter in especially the Christian faith was Satan, as he is consistently testing man's resolve in efforts to gain their souls, seeing whether man was worthy of heaven or fit for hell. In the trial of Job, we see this play out in detail as God makes a deal to Satan 
to prove that man's faith is untouchable. In brief, Job begins his life with good wealth, excellent health, a large family, and friends who support him. However, God slowly strips away all of Job's fortune, his family, his health, and his friends, leaving Job with nothing, not even the shirt on his back. In this, Job learns of the vastness of God and the unknowable in his faith, but continues to maintain his worship, as Satan could no longer continue his accusations and his role as an arbiter, he fades away, allowing God to return Job's wealth, return his health, return his family, and his friends as gifts. For the covenant, the role of the arbiter is a testament to the strength of the Sanghili, but as the enforcer of the prophets, it is ultimately a test of the warrior's faith in the great journey. As we see within the opening of Halo 2, we learn with Thel Vidam that taking on the role of the Arbiter means one's death, providing the prophets a means of control over the followers of the Great Journey. Seeing if a high-ranking elite's resolve was with his brothers-in-arms or to the Covenant. Next time, we'll be covering the next three races to join the Covenant. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.